Um, so this was to get you thinking about factoring again. And if you notice, each of these expressions looks pretty similar. They all have a 3x and an x, and then they have two numbers that multiply to 8. And you'll notice that depending on the order that these are in, we end up getting four different expressions on the right. And the reason for that is no matter what, the two numbers that I just highlighted in green are going to multiply to our eight, our constant at the end. And no matter what, this three X and this X, every term are going to multiply to three X squared. But depending on the order here, and tell me if my screen stops sharing because it keeps cutting out. We notice that here we get four X plus six X to give us the 10 X in the middle. Here we'd get two X plus 12 X to give us the 14 X in the middle. Here we get one X plus 24 X to give us 25 X in the middle. Here we have eight X times three X, eight uh, X plus three X to give us 11 X in the middle. So that's why you're going to end up when you're factoring, having to go through a bunch of combinations in your head or on paper to figure out how we actually factor. Um, so you may have tried these ones in the middle, or at the bottom, I mean, and been able to factor them. I don't have the answers in front of me, so I'm not going to do them out right now. Um, but does anyone have kind of questions about these patterns, like where we get this first term, this middle term, or this last term? I know I'm going pretty quickly because we don't have them. For the bottom of the page, mm -hmm. because there's a coefficient to x squared, are we still finding um, the two numbers that multiply and add to the constant and then the middle term? Great question. Not quite. So if you look up here, notice that the two numbers that I highlighted in green always add up to or multiply to the last term, the constant. But now we suddenly have a coefficient of x, so it's one extra step from yesterday. So this 3x and this x give us the 3x squared, and we're trying to find the combination here of our inner terms and outer terms to give us the 25x. So we call it when a equals 1, x squared plus something, x plus something, this is a 1 in front. That's when we can just use our, oops, not a 1 in the end, but... That's when we can just use our multiply and our add rule. As soon as there's another coefficient of x squared, you're suddenly going to have to do an extra, some extra thinking there. And you'll see, we're going to do a bunch of examples too. All right. So here's some key ideas. When we simplify, we double distribute, we distribute. Sorry, go ahead. We combine our like terms. When we factor, we separate everything into a product of parentheses. And when we solve, we get an actual solution. Our goal is going to be to factor in order to solve. So you saw this last week where we could here just factor out the x. And then we use what's called a zero product property to set each of these equal to zero. The problem is when we can't do that. When we have an x squared and an x and a constant, we now need to be able to factor. So this kind of goes with Josie's question. So this ax squared is always going to be the product of our firsts. It's going to be this 5x times this 3x. This c here is always going to be the product of our lasts, this 1 times this 2. The problem is figuring out how do we get the middle term. That's going to be the product of our inners and the product of our outers. And what ends up happening is you're just going to basically do trial and error. There are some other sort of formulaic ways to do it, but we find that the high school prefers you do trial and error and we prefer it because otherwise you're like wait was i supposed to double that or square it or like you're memorizing a formula and you're not really understanding why so our goal is going to be to start with something like this and figure out how we factor it so if you are in my packet can you go down to where it says part two level one factor and if you're not on my uh, cluster i know that miss um kruger just posted it, but if not, you can also take, um, just take notes on separate paper. So the first problems are the most basic. We say that a equals one. What I mean by that is that there's a coefficient of one in front of x squared in both of these problems. So you know that when you break it into two binomials, you'll have an x and an x. So you'll automatically get your x squared. And then you need to figure out, well, what multiplies to 10 and adds to 11? So oops, we would have a 10 and a 1. And we know that it's a positive and a positive because if they're multiplying to a positive, they're both the same sign. 
find it very hard to write on my iPad without zooming in. Both same sign. And they're adding to positive 11. Now we can, of course, check this by double distributing. We'd get x squared plus 10x plus 1x plus 10. So we can see that we get our x squareds from here. We get our 10 from here. And then if you do your inners and your outers, that's where you add those together to get the 11x. On problem number two, we're going to look for something similar. So two numbers that multiply to negative 10 and add to negative 3. So we're going to go with x's. We know that we want a 5 and a 2 because in my head I can say, all right, well, 5 times 2 is going to give me 10 and I can subtract them to 3. Since it's a negative 3, I know that I want my negative to go with the 5. So again, there's still a process here. You could try different combinations, but I'm able to figure that out in my head, and I could always check it. x squared minus 5x plus 2x minus 10. So these are my answers. I'm just checking it below, just to be clear. Check. And check. Mm -hmm. All right, can you guys try factoring number three and solving number four. And if you're not sure how to do one of those and just pause for a minute, I'm going to give you about one minute to do both of those. All right, does so anyone want to share what they got for number three? Uh, I can only see some of you. Uh, you can wave, you can unmute yourself and shout out. Anyone get an answer for number three? Lane, you want to share? What? Did you get an answer for number three? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's right, but... Uh, the first one's x minus 6, and then x minus 2 is the second one. Beautiful. And you can always tell if you're right, because you can multiply this back together to get x squared minus 6x minus 2x plus 12. We knew it was a minus and a minus because, again, we had the same sign if they're multiplying to a 12, a positive 12. And since we're trying to get to a negative 8, we're going to be adding those two negatives together. So we should always check it that way. Number four, was anyone able to factor number four that would be willing to share? Chloe, were you able to get this one? Um, uh, X minus seven is X minus one. X minus 7 and X minus 1. And again, we'd multiply them together to check that. Then we're not done yet because it says solve. So now we're going to set each of these parentheses equal to 0 because we know that one of them has to be 0. So either X minus 7 equals 0 or X minus 1 equals 0. So our answers are X equals 7 or X equals 1. And if you actually plug it in, 7 squared is 49 minus 8 times 7, so minus 56 plus 7, we get 0. 1 squared is 1 minus 8 times 1 plus 7 also gives us 0. So this is how we're now going to be able to solve these quadratics, which is ultimately our goal, is to be able to solve. We're basically building up the skill of factoring so that we are able to solve quadratic equations in the future, and it's probably the most used skill in Algebra 2. Are there any questions so far before I move on to some harder ones? 
So, so far we've been able to use mental math because of that one out front, right? So because we had a one in front of X squared, we're like, oh, well, we know it's gonna be an X and an X. And we're just trying to figure out what two numbers we can put in that are going to multiply to our constant and add to our linear term. The problem is once we get to something like this. So I'm gonna write out all the combinations and I'm gonna talk about different strategies to help you. So if I want three X squared, I know that I'm going to have a three X and an X, but I don't know how I'm going to combine this yet. I also know that I need to multiply to five. So my only factors of five are five and one, but I don't know the order yet. I'm gonna keep it always three X and X, because if I switch the three X and the X and I swap the five and the one, I'm just gonna get the same thing in a different order. So I have two different combinations that I have to try to figure out which of these is correct. No matter what, I know I'm going to get the three X squared from the three X times X, and no matter what, I know that I'm going to get the five, from the five and the one. So I basically have to say, well, is it the first one where here, I'm gonna write it actually over to the side right next to it. So here, my middle terms are three X plus five X. And here, my middle terms are 15 X plus X. So I can see that if my goal is to get the 16 X in the middle, that this first one is incorrect and that this second one is my answer. So in this case, we were lucky because I see all plus signs, so I know I don't have to try any negatives. I see that three, the only factors are three and one, and five, the only factors are five and one. The problem is when we have a ton of factors, that's going to get harder and harder and harder. So let's look at the next one, and then again, like I said, I'm gonna talk about some strategies here to make this faster for you. So if I want a five X squared, I know a five X and an X. That's not going to change because that's the only way I'm going to get five X squared. But now I need to figure out seven, but in this case, negative seven. So do I want negative one and positive seven or positive one and negative seven? Or do I want them the other way where I have negative seven and positive one or negative, what happened? I tried to get positive seven and negative one. So in this case, I have four different things I need to try. Now I knew that one was positive and one was negative, so I didn't have to try any with two negatives or two positives. And I want you right now to see if you can figure out which of these is the correct way to factor the expression above. And if you think you got it, chat me either choice one, choice two, choice three, or choice four. Send it right in the chat. Let's see how we're doing. And I see number five again. Yes. Because it, my screen lagged up. Yeah. All right, doing great. Ruby, how do you know it was choice three? Uh, well, because choice choices one and two, they were way too big. Um, and then I knew that it had to be negative 2x, so I could cross out the plus seven easily. Awesome. So as we get into more and more choices, one way you could do is literally write out every choice, try them as you go, and cross them out as you go. It's not particularly efficient, um, but it will work. And so what a lot of times what we, what I see people do and what I personally do is I write out my factors of A. What I mean by A is we call this AX squared plus BX plus C. I write out my factors of A and I write out my factors of C, seven and one, and I do some mental math and I pair stuff together. 
So I say, all right, well, what if I pair the five with the seven and the one with the one? And I wouldn't normally draw them. I'd literally be pointing with my fingers, but because I'm on the iPad, it's harder for me to show it. And I'd say, well, that's going to give me a 35. That's illogical. It's way too big. If I have a 35 and a one, it's never going to work. It doesn't matter if I'm trying at positives and negatives. So I'd say, all right, well, what if I can get a product of a five and a product of a seven? Well, that's good because I know based on this sign that I'm going to have one positive and one negative, which means I'm basically going to be subtracting. So if I have a product of a seven and a product of five, I'll be able to subtract to two. So then I'd say, okay, well, that means that I have a five X and that five has to be paired with a one. I know that from right here. And then I have a one X. That's what this one is. These are the five X and the one X. And that one has to be paired with this seven. Now I want it to be negative. So I'm going to put the minus here. The more you do this, the better you're going to get at it. There's not like a way to just get better at it. And so what I did over there was I wrote out my factors of A, I wrote out my factors of C, and I figured out which ones compare together. And as you get to more and more factors, I'm actually going to do number seven with you also. Um, you'll see where it's like, okay, I can eliminate that when it doesn't work. And I'm just kind of mixing and matching, but in a logical way so that I know which ones I've tried. One other thing I do want to point out quickly before I go to seven and eight is if you look down at number nine here, always look for a greatest common factor first. I would look at this and I'd say, oh, there's a lot of factors of six. There's four. And there's even more factors of 36. But if I factor out my GCF first, if I factor out my six, then I get x squared minus 5x plus six. Well, that's beautiful because if I have a one in front of my x squared, it becomes a much easier problem. I'm just looking for numbers that multiply to positive six and subtract to negative five. So always look for your greatest common factor first. That's less important to me right now. I'd rather us see some more factoring. So I'm going to do out number seven, and then I'll have you guys try number eight. So if I were writing out all my different combinations, I'd have to write all my combinations with 4x and x. Then I'd have to also write out all my combinations with 2x and 2x. So you can certainly do that. I think it's six combinations because it's a five and a one. It may actually only be three combinations. But if I was making my little A and C chart, and you'll probably, you might start it by writing out all your combinations. And once you get really good at this, find a different way to do it. So I'd have, I could have 4x and 1x, or I could have 2x and 2x. And I know I'll have five and one. And I start doing some pairing. Do I want 20 and one? No, that's way too big. Do I want four and five? Well, that's promising because I'm trying to get to nine. So now I fill it in. My four has to match with my one. And my five has to match with my other one. I'd check my signs. I'd multiply it out. I'd make sure that it works, which it does. I know I have my four X squared. I have my plus four X. I have my plus five X. I have my plus one, which works. So you're basically just trying different combinations. And it seems like, why am I doing this? But you're doing this because you're now going to be able to solve all of these quadratics. And what that really is, is you're really solving curved lines, which you're going to graph in the fall. And you're finding where are the x-intercepts because we're setting it equal to zero. We know when we set something equal to zero, instead of y, you're finding x-intercepts. So you're going to spend months on that.